pleased and honored to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Olga Noskin is a neurologist and she is with the Neurology Group of Bergen County, of um, Bergen County, and that is, oh my goodness, that is located in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Dr. Noskin, welcome and thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much, Susan, and, and thank you uh, to the audience. Thank you for coming. And I think a couple of people were actually invited over the past couple of days by me, unfortunately. Their family members are in the hospital, so hopefully they're here and they will learn something as well. I appreciate, thank you to Valley Hospital for providing this forum and uh, a series of these lectures. Um, so yeah, so I'm actually a general neurologist here in the community. I'm in Ridgewood. I am also um, additionally trained as a vascular or stroke neurologist. Um, and um, so, but I see all kinds of patients. Today we will be talking about stroke and I will uh, review uh, a lot of things with you. Um, it may, it, thankfully we, we do have a recording of this, um, of this lecture. Unfortunately, it is not terribly interactive, but um, you are welcome to put in some comments in the chat and q and I will be asking some questions of the audience. It will not feel like it's um, you know, being addressed live, but I will definitely answer all the questions uh, or most of the questions at the end of this session. Um, so hopefully this will be very educational and um, um, uh, thank you again. So without further ado, okay. So we will talk about a couple of things. We'll talk about stroke definitions because people ask me about this all the time. Um, and um, maybe a lot of you are either patients or have, been, have family members who've been patients. I get the same questions over and over and I think it will be helpful to go over the types of strokes and the definitions that we use. Uh, how do we recognize a stroke both in the hospital and in the community? Um, uh, what are the outcomes of strokes? What types of treatments do we have available currently? Um, mostly acute treatments, but also we'll talk about preventative. And then we'll talk about this very important concept, which is what's driving stroke care in um, the US and the world, uh, which is Tempus Cerebrum Est. And you can, I'm sure a lot of you know what that means, but uh, we'll talk about it. All right, so, um, you know, I've been giving this lecture uh, with adjustments for a very long time, and stroke has moved to the fifth place um, as a common, as a cause of uh, death in the U.S. It is unfortunately still a second um, in the world. Um, it is very prevalent. There's 800,000 strokes in the U.S. each year. This slide is pre-COVID. Um, things have changed slightly from COVID, uh, the number is up. Uh, every 40 seconds, somebody has a stroke. Obviously it's a very devastating disease and we'll talk about more statistics uh, about why, uh, what kind of impact this has on the society. Uh, some of the definitions we use, what is a stroke? A stroke is a clinical syndrome of rapid onset of, um, of uh, damage, uh, neurological damage that lasts more than 24 hours. Neurological damage, when they, what they mean by focal, uh, we mean difficulty speaking, moving, uh, visual problems, uh, difficulties, uh, seeing, uh, uh, walking, and so on. So um, th this is what we call focal cerebral deficit, something that causes part of the body to um, uh, dysfunction. Um, there is a concept that we don't use very much, which is a stroke and evolution. Strokes can evolve over the course of the first 24 hours. They can go up and down in symptoms, and we are therefore recommending patients stay in the hospital because strokes evolve. Um, honestly, there's uh, it, this is a misnomer, uh, same as a mini stroke. You know, there's really no such thing as a mini stroke. There is a concept that we'll talk about uh, called a TIA. Uh, but a minor stroke, as you can imagine, is um, an event where symptoms uh, are very mild or they disappear relatively quickly. A TIA is, a, is something you will hear a lot, and it stands for transient ischemic attack. Um, and it is actually the same thing as a stroke, but symptoms typically last less than 24 hours or more likely less than one hour. Um, these um, events result in a complete recovery. And the way I des des describe them to my patients, a TIA is a warning sign. It's a warning that you may have a stroke very soon or you are at a very high risk of a stroke. Strokes 
happen in the brain. Believe it or not, I do have to explain it a lot of times because uh, patients understand um, an infarct. Patients understand that an infarct happens in the heart. Um, an insult or a stroke um, does not happen in the heart. That's uh, a condition of the brain. The brain is responsible for many of our functions and we will have um, some ex examples of that. Um, I will have just a warning. I will have a couple of uh, slides with some gross pictures of what our main organ, which is the brain, looks like. So I will have a little warning about it so uh, people can be prepared. It may be a little bit gross to look at, but it's important to see. Um, so there are a couple of types of strokes. Um, I don't know if this is in, okay, I'm going to move this a little bit. Um, the, there's bleeding strokes and non-bleeding strokes. The non-bleeding strokes we also call ischemic. Uh, or thromboembolic, these strokes happen due to lack of oxygen going to a part of the brain. And these comprise the majority of strokes that we see. And then there are strokes that are called bleeding or hemorrhagic strokes. Those comprise about 15%. And uh, they are further subdivided into uh, strokes that happen due to trauma from subdural or epidural uh, bleeding collection, uh, aneurysm, uh, rupture, which are called subarachnoid strokes, or cerebral strokes within the brain itself. Okay, I'll give you some examples of those. Now, how do strokes do their damage? We know that um, they happen in the brain, but remember, not everybody that has a stroke has a speech impediment. Not everybody winds up in a wheelchair with a um, with a right or left arm weakness or leg weakness. Some people have them and some people have a completely different constellation of symptoms. And this is the answer. And usually this, okay. So location, location, location. This is the answer to that question. Um, everything in our brain, um, everything we do has a specific part of the brain that's devoted to that function. So for instance, this is just the slice through the brain. Obviously it doesn't have a nice rainbow color to it, but um, a slice through the brain that uh, depicts which parts of the brain are devoted to which functions. Now, if you take that function and you make a pictorial out of it, it will look like a very strange distorted human. I called it friendly. It doesn't look very friendly, but it, this is what we look like sort of inside the brain. Uh, a lot of the brain cortex or tissue is devoted to our hands, lips, tongue, and actually our private organs. Uh, not a lot is devoted to our backs or our buttocks or our calves uh, because those um, evolutionarily, those are not very important for the brain. Um, so if you have even a very small um, if you have a, a large enough stroke in the brain, it will potentially wipe out a whole section of the brain that's, that um, subserves hand function. That's why people become weak and so on. But we'll talk more about it. But this is what a homunculus is. It's not a human, but a homunculus. Uh, now, I know this may be a very busy slide, so don't go crazy reading it. I actually just made it a little bigger, but uh, different parts of the brain uh, again, subserve different functions. And when a person has a stroke, which means part of their brain dies, they lose function that that part of the brain is responsible for. For example, if you have a stroke, usually on the left side, in the front, you can have a form of, of aphasia. Aphasia is a, is a language dysfunction where patients cannot come up with words and so on. There's a part of the brain that has to do with calculation and reading and um, understanding which side is your right side and the left side and so on. Okay. Now, what are the common signs of stroke that everybody should know? And we'll go over this again, but uh, there are a couple of common signs. Uh, signs. Uh, weakness. Uh, it can happen on one side. It can sometimes happen on one side and quickly on the other side, which is alternating. It can affect the arm, leg, face, and other parts of the body. Uh, numbness, uh, inability to walk, which does not have to occur due to weakness. Uh, loss of vision, it can involve one eye or both eyes. People can have double vision. Sometimes they even have flipped vision. I'll, I'll tell you about some 
unusual signs of stroke later on. Uh, people are unable to speak. They can either not produce any sounds or they um, use different words or there's just jumbled up speech that comes out. That it all comes under speak, speaking difficulties. There are some unusual symptoms of strokes. Uh, personality changes um, oftentimes follow a stroke. Uh, patients either can become belligerent, angry, or very docile and quiet, uh, different from their usual personality. They can uh, develop neglect, um, and that uh, manifests as uh, basically not realizing that they have one side of their body anymore. They forget to dress it. They forget to put on makeup on one side of the body. They walk into walls. Um, sometimes uh, some of the more unusual presentations would be trying to fight your body and throw one arm or one leg off the bed because you don't think it belongs to you. These are very bizarre, but they do occur. Uh, a pain or swelling sensation can happen. Some patients see double, but they can also see images out of place. They can see a doorknob on the wall or on the, on the, on the ceiling, for instance. Um, and sometimes the whole world is upside down. There's a stroke that can do that as well. So um, other symptoms that are unusual, some patients develop crawling sensations. Those can also happen with epileptic seizures. Uh, deja vu sensation, feeling like you've been here before, you've seen it before, amnesia, alien hand. Um, again, it's similar to neglect where you don't believe your own hand belongs to you. Patients develop hallucinations. They either see people or some shapes, colors, um, or um, you know, one, one patient described seeing kind of a QR code uh, type image in her visual field. Uh, some patients develop, this is a long-term long um, side effect of stroke, uh, patients develop stiffness on one side of the body, and we call it spasticity, and there's treatment for that type of stiffness. Um, now, we'll just start with hemorrhages because they're not as, frequent, not as common, but I still want to uh, discuss them a little bit and show you some picture. Now, there are some graphic pictures, just a warning. Okay. So uh, this is what um, intracerebral hemorrhage would look like. Um, this is a CAT scan, just a slice through our brain. This white blob is a hemorrhage, okay? Um, this is what, as these two are actual brain uh, autopsy uh, samples from a different patient most likely. Uh, obviously, this patient is not alive, and uh, something similar has happened to this patient. Um, and this is what it looks like on, in, on, on uh, autopsy. Uh, this is an example of what's called a subarachnoid hemorrhage. A subarachnoid hemorrhage does not have a blob. As you can see, there's no in blob inside the brain, uh, but it is it basically the blood just spreads itself all over the surface of the brain. Um, again, this is what a CAT scan looks like. Um, this person um, was probably very, very sick just by looking at this CAT scan. There's a lot of pressure that the brain is under. There's only so much room that there is under the skull. So if there's blood products, the brain um, becomes pressurized and very unhappy. This person obviously did not survive. So this is the brain and it's covered in blood as you can see. Now, uh, just quickly, what are some risk factors of hemorrhages? And I'm not going to specify uh, whether it's um, cerebral, uh, intracerebral, or subarachnoid or others, but um, high blood pressure is a risk factor for both hemorrhages and non-bleeding strokes. We'll talk about it. Some people have bleeding disorders where they're likely to bleed. Some people have aneurysms or these what are called AVMs. Uh, sometimes patients are on medications and uh, they're not tolerating these medications very well. Obviously, they're on medicines for a reason, blood, thin uh, uh, blood thinners, uh, but um, under the circumstances, uh, they may bleed from these medications or in the setting of these medications. Trauma is a big risk factor. And there's this genetic condition called amyloid angiopathy, which damages blood vessels and causes patients to bleed. Uh, for subarachnoid hemorrhage that usually happens from an aneurysm, there's a very classic presentation that I want you guys to remember, and that is sudden worst headache of my life. 
forced to do. Sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, we are all very much attuned to this presentation and anyone who comes to the hospital or if anybody calls you on the phone and says, I just had the worst headache of my life, they must go to the hospital because uh, they, they may worsen very quickly and they potentially could be in trouble, their life could be in trouble. Uh, neck stiffness is another uh, sign of it. Uh, we call it meningismus patients with meningitis, which is a, 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 an infection present in a similar way a lot of times as well. Patients who've had a worse headache of their life and then suddenly become drowsy must come to the hospital. Their pressure inside the head may be dangerously high. Uh, there are other complications of hemorrhages. Um, again, loss of function, just like after any stroke. Herniation, as I said, there's only so much room that our skulls have. And if there's a lot of pressure inside the skull because of continuous bleeding, for example, uh, then parts of the brain are going to be pushed out, literally pushed out of the skull. And uh, that is called herniation, and it is a very dangerous condition. Um, again, same thing, uh, increased pressure can sometimes cause what's called hydrocephalus, just build up of fluid in the, in the brain. Um, because of increased pressure, the arteries that feed the brain and bring oxygen to the brain may be collapsed and uh, compressed and that could potentially lead to spasm of these arteries and subsequent ischemic stroke, non-bleeding stroke. So this is why patients with uh, these types of hemorrhages oftentimes stay in the hospital for up to two weeks because we monitor them very carefully. Uh, you know, this sounds bad, but you know, obviously some a lot of patients survive uh, intracerebral hemorrhage and are fine, but we need to monitor them very closely. We need to make sure they don't receive any medications that could make them worse. We monitor their blood pressure very carefully, and we ask neurosurgery to be on board and um, on standby in case a patient needs an emergent surgery. Um, this is just a picture for you. Um, it, this is called an angiogram. Um, it's a catheter angiogram, very similar to what you probably are more familiar with in terms of cardiac um, events and cardiac stenting. It's the same type of a procedure, a catheter being threaded through an artery in the groin and up through the heart and into the head. Um, we get a picture like this where we can see all the blood vessels that feed the brain. And right here, you can see there's a big giant ball. We don't have balls in our um, you know, in our brains, other than something like this, where you can have a uh, vessel that's uh, suddenly dilated and it looks like a ball. Um, it's called an aneurysm. Obviously, there are other masses that can happen in the brain, but things that would light up on an angiogram would be an aneurysm. This is a pretty large aneurysm. Now, this is what uh, uh, that what our neurosurgical interventional um, colleagues and neurosurgeons can do with these aneurysms when they grow a certain size. They can be either clipped, and this is obviously a surgery, or they can be coiled. A small coil, very tiny coil, can be threaded up through the artery and occlude the aneurysm, which basically makes it stop grow. And uh, the risk of this aneurysm ever rupturing decreases quite a bit. And this is what it looks like on an angiogram. Okay, so that's, um, you know, if you guys want to start typing up any questions about hemorrhages, you may, but I will get back to all of those questions. So let's just spend some time now on ischemic strokes. And obviously, this is the majority of most all the strokes. Again, we have some graphic pictures ahead, just so you know. Okay, so uh, these two pictures, this is um, a CAT scan on the right-hand side. Uh, this is a CAT scan of the brain. Again, our brain has two halves, two hemispheres, the left and the right, and they're supposed to be equal. They're, they're supposed to look the same. Obviously, you can see there's a big shadow on the right. This is the right side of the brain. There's a shadow which corresponds to what's called an ischemic stroke. On an MRI of the brain, which is just a little bit more detailed, um, this is a different patient. Again, you can see a shadow of a stroke. 
Um, it comes up white, sometimes it looks black. It really depends on which MRI sequence you're looking at. And unfortunately, this patient is no longer alive and he or she has had, and I can tell, I cannot tell if it's a he or she from the brain, but uh, he or she um, has had a stroke a long time ago, possibly years ago. And uh, because the part of the brain, this part of the brain, which just looks a little dark, over time it um, involutes, it, it disappears. This part of the brain is dead. So it will be replaced by fluid. And uh, on autopsy, all you see is a big gaping hole, okay? This patient may have in fact lived a fulfilling long life, even though there was a, this very large defect. And that's something that we need to keep remembering that patients can live a very good long life despite these uh, events. Okay, uh, now why do these strokes happen? Why do parts of the brain just suddenly die off? Uh, well, this is a very busy diagram um, if you've never seen it, but um, we have a very, very intricate, very detailed uh, tree of arterial supply to the brain. Uh, a lot of uh, large, medium, and small arteries that feed every single part of the brain. And those arteries can, as I like to say to my patients, poop out sometimes. They do uh, lose their ability to function. They either get occluded or they uh, break or they rupture or di dissect. Um, and as they do so, uh, the brain does not uh, receive any more oxygen to that, part, uh, to that part of it. And as a result, you can have a stroke. And um, a lot of times you may hear us uh, say somebody had a middle cerebral artery stroke or a basilar artery stroke. Uh, we just know that the basal artery supplies certain parts of the brain, so we uh, tell each other that this is where the stroke has occurred, and this is the artery we need to pay special attention to. Um, this is another way, again, these are angiograms uh, of the same uh, pictorial I just showed you. This is what the arteries of the brain look like. Um, the labels do not come as part of our body. Uh, these are just um, labels that were inserted electronically, obviously, but this is uh, the angiogram that our colleagues, um, interventional neurosurgeons see. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to this. Okay, again, this is a CAT scan with a stroke now in the left hemisphere. And uh, I wanted to discuss what are some of the common reasons, you know, patients oftentimes ask me, you know, why did I have a stroke? What are the most common reasons? Uh, patients can have um, a blood clot coming from somewhere else, could be from the heart. Uh, an artery could be diseased from various mechanisms such as high cholesterol, high, uh, hypertension, definitely smoking. Um, uh, the vessel of the wall of the vessel of the artery may be very diseased. Uh, again, we talked about hemorrhages. So hemorrhages can sometimes cause strokes by compressing the arteries. Uh, there are other mechanisms, and these are not risk factors. We're talking about mechanisms right now. We'll talk about the actual risk factors for stroke. Um, patients can have venous infarctions as opposed to arterial infarctions. Their arteries can break. Our arteries can slice and break. We call it a dissection, and there are some risk factors for that as well. Sometimes patients have a very thick blood syndrome. Uh, some of them have a, what's called a hypercoagulable state. Um, it's genetic oftentimes, uh, or they have a condition called polycythemia. Once again, if they have brain tumors or abscesses, the pressure from these can compress the arteries and cause strokes. And then there's other things, even infections can cause strokes. Uh, even less common mechanisms are more genetic. Uh, we see them, but very, very infrequently. Um, I do have a lot of, not a lot, but I have a couple of patients with catacil, uh, which is an autosomal dominant condition. And basically it runs through families and uh, it's a very devastating condition that affects young people a lot of times. Um, I also want to point out uh, this condition called reversible vasoconstriction syndrome, um, which a lot of times presents with, again, a worst headache of life um, or thunderclap headache, as we call it, and can uh, result in strokes later on. 
this condition is associated with the use of certain drugs, uh, both um, uh, you know, medical drugs and illicit drugs. Uh, migraines uh, can cause a stroke, or I should say they are associated with strokes, uh, especially women who suffer from migraines with aura are at an increased risk of stroke. Uh, I will just mention that women with this condition with migraines with aura who are on birth control pills um, at least quadruple their risk of stroke. And if they smoke, it's pretty much a guarantee that they're going to have a stroke. So. Um, just keep that in mind, you know, uh, we, some, some people are at risk and uh, just because they're young, if they have migraines, they may, they may suffer strokes. Uh, well, you may have heard this term called lacunar infarction. It's basically a smaller stroke in the brain, um, a lot of times deep inside the brain. These usually are caused by small vessel disease. Um, and again, due to hypertension, uh, the symptoms may vary, and just remember that, uh, you know, just because it's small doesn't mean that you're going to have, or people have minor symptoms. Remember, of uh, that's homunculus. You know, if you have a very small infarct smack in the middle of that hand region, you may potentially have a, a lot of weakness in the hand and so on. And the deeper the strokes are in the brain, the more likely um, it is that patients have a more devastating stroke because all the fibers, all the nerve fibers are very, very close together and it's easy to damage all of them. Uh, sometimes uh, I've had this discussion just today. In fact, um, somebody who was found to have a lot of strokes on their brain but never knew it was functioning normally throughout their life. Uh, patients can have silent strokes because our brains are smart and they can accommodate. All right, I've had this before. Okay, so uh, just quickly, and we'll move on to something else. Uh, how do people recover? Um, you know, 10% of stroke survivors recover almost completely. Uh, we'd like for this number to be higher. Um, some, a lot of them require, re recover with minor impairments, um, and then obviously the rest uh, may either die or require a lot of care and skilled care. Uh, there are a lot of lifestyle changes that occur once the patient comes home. As I said, remember a lot of patients' behavior changes, their ability to do their what's called activities of daily living changes. They need a lot of help and supervision. Um, their ability to eat certain foods changes. Uh, they develop memory loss. They have to stop working a lot of times. Driving becomes an issue. It's a humongous burden. Stroke is a human, humongous burden on the society. Um, and sometimes, yes, they, sometimes patients have pain post-stroke. Now, uh, we don't want this situation. We want as many people as possible to have a very small stroke and recover as much as possible. So uh, this is a concept we are living by, which means that time is brain. Uh, and what we know is that somebody actually calculated, what does it mean time is brain? We, uh, they calculated that when somebody is in the middle of having a stroke, every minute, almost 2 million neurons die, every minute, which means that if we had a mechanism to stop a stroke from progressing and we could, um, we could speed up that mechanism by seconds and minutes, we would save millions, if not trillions of neurons and potentially restore function. Um, again, you know, every time there's a delay, 15 minutes delay, remember every minute, 2 million uh, neurons die. So if you delay a stroke care or bringing a patient to the, to the hospital where you can care for them by 15 minutes uh, out of a thousand patients, this many patients will have trouble. Uh, either walking or living independently or possibly dying. So every second, every minute, but definitely every second counts. Now, remember, this is what we preach, but this is not what happens in real life. Now, people don't always respond to symptoms, especially if it happens to you. Some people don't recognize symptoms correctly. Uh, they don't know what uh, stroke symptoms are. There is a humongous aspect of denial. I could probably easily uh, move denial up to the top of the list. Um, 
a lot of patients don't realize that something could be done for them. They worry about the cost of coming to the hospital. They think that their symptoms will go away. They sleep it off. A lot of patients sleep it off. Uh, they don't, they still don't trust hospitals. And of course, especially in the COVID era over the past almost two years, there's a lot of fear coming into the hospital. All right, um, there are some things, and this is really not so much for, um, I don't want to sway the community in thinking that maybe certain things um, need to be considered as non-strokes. This is really for the doctors, just to show you how difficult it is sometimes to decide if somebody is having a stroke or not. There are other conditions that look like strokes, that could look like strokes, and that is seizures, migraines, obviously intoxication, infections, uh, brain tumors, certain psychological disorders. Uh, this is for us to scratch our heads and do it as quickly as possible. And uh, we always um, err on the side of caution and we always consider something to be a stroke first. Uh, we have guidelines at this time. These are national guidelines and world guidelines. Um, in fact, this is becoming outdated, this slide. Basically, uh, what it says is that we have no time to spare. We need to get patients to be treated with a treatment that you may have heard about, TPA, we'll talk about it. We need to get them from the door um, to the doctor's care and onto a CAT scanner and uh, to get treatment as soon as possible, okay? Um, and uh, we want the 60 minutes to be 20 minutes if possible. And in fact, we want patients to come into the hospitals as soon as they recognize symptoms. We want this time zero to be minus 30 minutes. Uh, and we want a lot of these uh, treatments to in fact be available in the ambulance itself. Um, and it is already happening um, in the country. A CAT scanner can be made available in the, in the ambulance and so on. Um, it's, this is still the future, but uh, we're moving in that direction. We want things to be done as fast as possible. We have no time. Um, again, time is brain. Uh, now, what is the most important thing you want to know when you uh, talk to a doctor or uh, emergency uh, medical technician or uh, paramedic when you recognize stroke signs? What is the most important question? Um, Maybe somebody is putting it in. Not yet. Okay. The most important question, because we only have so much time uh, to administer certain therapies, is um, a question that answers um, to how long have these symptoms been going on? If you just tell us, oh, this patient woke up and they have symptoms, that's not when the symptoms began. The most important question is, when was the last time this person was seen normal? Because unfortunately, that's the best estimation of onset of time that we can have. Uh, just because you find a patient on the floor or in the morning does not mean that's when their symptoms began. That's not the onset of symptoms. Why is it very important to know the onset of symptoms? Because what we can do in the hospital, in the emergency room, can only be safe if we know the time of onset. There are certain interventions that can hurt patients if we give them too late. So it is very important to know. And now, <laughs> I love this to be interactive, but we'll try if you guys uh, wanna go into the chat, it's okay. I, I give everyone credit regardless, but how late can we intervene? So we have two types of interventions that are acute. Uh, one is what's called TPA, okay? And it is given through the IV. And it's a clot buster, okay? This is a medicine that can burst a blood clot, which has just developed and just occluded the artery. Um, and I don't see anyone typing, but that's okay. Um, the window used to be three hours, but now for a few years, it has been expanded to up to four and a half hours. Not everybody is eligible to get TPA, um, within four and a half hours, there are some um, what are called rule outs, uh, some, um, some conditions that do not allow us to do that, but most patients are eligible. And then we have uh, 
uh, a set of interventional invasive procedures that can actually go in and fetch the blood clot out of the brain. Um, and we on, also have a window that's open for, uh, for this intervention. And that window has recently been expanded up to 24 hours. And this is relatively recent and we're very excited about it. So we can potentially um, reverse the effects of strokes um, up to 24 hours. That does not mean, again, you do not want to wait for 24 hours because the damage is happening every single minute. Some patients can handle it better than others. Um, therefore, you still want to come to the hospital as soon as possible. These treatments are available, both of them in comprehensive stroke centers and the Valley Hospital is a comprehensive stroke center. Okay, just the picture, once again, our angiogram. Now this is just half of the brain, half a hemisphere with all of the arteries intact. And as you can see, it's like a big network. It's like a spider web of arteries trying to supply oxygen to the brain. Yet, if you look on the other side of the brain, there's a big void. There's an occluded artery. This artery is blocked. So therefore, a big chunk of the brain is not getting any oxygen. And we want to open up this artery as soon as possible so that brain can survive and breathe again. This is what it looks like a lot of times on the CAT scan. We actually see a clot inside the brain. Uh, this is another... Uh, technology which is available at Valley um, and uh, most comprehensive stroke centers. It's called CAT scan perfusion. It's telling, it's, it's telling us how much of the brain is at risk for a stroke and how much of the brain has already had an irreversible stroke. And if there is a mismatch between these two colors, like here, for example, there's a very big mismatch, almost 120 uh, milliliters or cc's we potentially can intervene and still save this brain. If we don't do anything, there is a very good chance that this brain could, this big chunk of the brain could die and the patient would be devastated. This is just a different picture. This is, we, this is what we look at, okay? Uh, a part of the brain that has already had a stroke, irreversible, we cannot do anything about it but then there's a big chunk that is potentially still at risk. It's much larger. Okay. I know, I'm sorry, I'm giving you a, a, an anatomy and radiology um, a speed review. I apologize about that. Uh, we have uh, had a lot of different uh, retrieval devices, clot retrieval devices that have been developed over many, many years. Um, and some of them are like rotor rooters. Some of them are little nets that catch the thrombus. These are tiny. These are just very, very small in size. And uh, they're maneuvered almost blindly by our interventional neuroradiologist under x-ray guidance. Um, it is a very, very complicated procedure. Um, it does not involve brain surgery, but it is still a very dangerous and complicated procedure in good skilled hands. Uh, the risks are small, however, but the benefits are very large. Uh, this is what happens. Uh, again, uh, this is a huge size. The actual size of this net is probably this big. Um, and this is what a clot would look like. And um, now that it's out, there's a very large part of the brain that's probably finally breathing again and able to function. And the person can maybe even go home in a few days. Um, not everybody will benefit because, again, um, sometimes we do these procedures too late, um, and sometimes there are complications, usually very rare, but um, again, we, it, the sooner we do them, the more, the, the more is the likelihood that it will go well. Okay, uh, just make sure. All right, so what are the risk factors for, um, let me get rid of this of uh, strokes, okay? These are the main risk factors of ischemic strokes. Hypertension is number one, smoking, and then uh, a lot of other conditions. Uh, the most important one that I want to just point out, which is sometimes not obvious, and I always talk to patients about is sleep apnea. Uh, there are a lot of patients who don't realize that they have sleep apnea. Um, it is not just about snoring or not snoring. 
um, sleep apnea can occur in patients who are not overweight and who do not snore. But there are some screening questions that we ask of them and our pulmonary sleep specialists are on board uh, to help us out. Patients whose sleep apnea is controlled are, uh, do decrease their risk of strokes and heart disease. Okay. Uh, what about COVID? Of course, everybody wants to know about COVID. Uh, we have seen an increase of strokes um, when we had a lot of COVID patients on the units uh, before we learned uh, about the risks that COVID poses and the fact that it results in strokes, not, a, not just in the brain, but in other parts of the body, including the lungs. Uh, we started seeing a lot of very, very unusual looking strokes. And um, so far we think, we don't know exactly how COVID does it or how, how this coronavirus rather um, does the damage, but these are the four possibilities. It damages the heart, it creates uh, a hyperviscosity, the blood becomes thicker. It also damages the blood vessels themselves. And there's also an immune attack that our own body uh, mounts against this virus that can affect ourselves and can cause uh, neurological damage. Now, when patients come into the hospital and they stay in the hospital typically for a couple of days, this is the workup that we recommend to be done in the hospital. Uh, we have some blood work that gets done. Um, patients who are young, maybe younger than 50 years of age, have specific blood tests that we look for, uh, which would not be as relevant for patients who are older. Uh, we look at their arteries, the carotid arteries, and also brain arteries, making sure that they're not blocked. Uh, we look at their heart, the structure and the function of the heart, and we put them on something called telemetry, looking at the heart rate and uh, um, rhythm. Uh, there are some invasive tests that we uh, often recommend strongly, um, and those are called transesophageal echo echocardiogram. Uh, this is a test that looks at the heart a little bit closer in case we suspect that there may be some structural abnormalities. Uh, we do an angiogram. You guys are now experts in angiograms, so we look for uh, various um, uh, inflammatory causes and aneurysms and so on. Uh, we do what's called a loop recorder. Or, um, uh, ILR, loop recorder placement. This is a very tiny little battery. It's not a pacemaker. It's just a very tiny battery that gets placed under the skin and stays in listening to the heart rate for up to three years. It is very useful uh, for our workup, stroke workup. Sorry. Oh, yep, there it is. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I didn't mean to make you dizzy. Um, and sometimes we do a spinal tap. Um, again, looking for unusual causes of stroke, such as infections and infl inflammation. Uh, as an outpatient, we uh, like to see our patients for follow-up because we talk about uh, their ongoing symptoms and management. We talk about prognosis. Uh, we, we help um, our uh, internists and cardiology colleagues manage medications because sometimes, believe it or not, low blood pressure is not the answer. Sometimes we need blood pressures to be high. Um, we talk about, we remind patients about dietary uh, changes that they should uh, go, that they should um, take on. Uh, weight control is very important. And uh, we like to see our patients once in a while. And uh, I see my stroke patients probably uh, once every three months in the beginning and at least once every six months uh, going forward because there's always some questions that they have and bring up to me. Um, diets are important. There are certain diets that are healthier than others. There's actually a statement uh, by the American Headache Association and the American Stroke Association that recommended a Mediterranean style diet um, to be helpful in terms of lowering stroke risk. And we certainly agree with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with Mediterranean style diet. It's very tasty. Um, okay, so this is a very good mnemonic for everybody to remember. We, you guys have already heard about the common signs of strokes, but this is something you need to know in case you see a patient with new or, or a loved one, or even yourself, God forbid, uh, with symptoms uh, that are 
uh, suggestive of stroke. B fast, okay? B stands for balance problems. And these refer to acute sudden changes, not things that have been going on for a year or a month and you kind of got tired of them. I'm sorry to say they, these refer only to the symptoms that have just occurred within the past uh, few minutes or uh, a day or two. Loss of balance, difficulty with vision, any facial asymmetry, you ask the patient to smile and see if they have a drooping of one side or the other. Um, do they have some difficulty with their arms? You can ask them to lift their arms up, close the eyes and shake the head side to side. If one arm starts falling down, um, that is a sign of a stroke potentially. The speech may be garbled. Uh, that's pretty obvious a lot of times. Um, don't start looking for problems with the teeth or call the dentist right away because first you need to think stroke. Um, and you need to call 911. I usually have a slide saying, you know, do not call your husband, your wife, uh, neighbor, your rabbi. Call 911. That's the right way to go about it. Okay. And uh, that is my, my talk. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, here's my phone number. I'm located in Ridgewood. Uh, we have um, a couple of stroke neurologists in my group. We all take care of patients with strokes in the hospital, um, and we will be happy to see any of your family members or yourself if you have any questions or any other questions not stroke related. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> that's one, one's 50. Okay. Not too bad. That was wonderful. Wow, it's really... It's fascinating, you know, um, the science and, and there's, there seems to be a lot being done to, you know, to advance stroke treatment, which is so wonderful too, you know, but the, the calling 911, that's the big one, right? You know, so important. Um, so just, I don't know if you see any questions yeah, there. I can, them. I can see, I, I see one in chat and one in the question, so I can see them. Okay. Um, is hydrocephalus similar to and distinguishable with stroke? Um, so, it is not similar to stroke, but uh, remember, brains, um, our brains are ultimately responsible for the functions that we have. So both hydrocephalus and strokes can uh, potentially result in loss of certain functions. Um, they can be, they can look similar sometimes, uh, but in terms of entities, there are two completely different entities. One has to do with uh, fluid pressure and the other has to do with actual loss of brain tissue, which is a stroke, okay? Um, okay, I'll go to the other question. I had a stroke four years ago. I had a stroke four years ago. I did the usual physiotherapy, still have pain and neuropathy on my left side, especially left hand and arm, thigh and left foot. Is there any medication that might alleviate some of these symptoms? Okay, so this is a very good question. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I don't know if you remember, one of the slides did mention that one of the long-term side effects of strokes can be pain. Um, and uh, it can either come as part of, um, uh, you know, what's called central pain, um, or it could be spasticity from muscle spasms. Um, but there are parts of the brain that unfortunately, when damaged, can, uh, can create pain. Uh, there are medications that can make it better. Uh, you, I would, obviously, we would have to talk to you um, about them in person because some medications may be contraindicated in your particular condition. Um, physical therapy is a good, um, is definitely the right way to go because you need, if you are able to utilize the left side, you must, um, you must uh, use the left side as much as possible. That will, so to speak, tell your brain that it is time to normalize that side. It is a very long process. It is not completely um, gone, unfortunately, the pain may not be completely gone as time goes on, but there are ways to manage it. Um, I would definitely suggest talking to your neurologist about the different options. You can at least feel better, I believe. Okay. Um, what is cardiologist's role in this? Um, so if you remember, uh, a lot of the uh, mechanisms of stroke uh, have to do with uh, the heart. 
Uh, you can either, some patients have an irregular heart rate, which can result in blood clots forming inside the heart, and we need the cardiologist to help us guide us in finding that irregular heart rate. Sometimes the heart muscle is very weak, and uh, we need to provide certain medications to patients in order to keep their hearts beating stronger. Again, the cardiologist will help us do that. So uh, we work very, very intimately with the cardiologist. A lot of times they see our patients while they're in the hospital and they run some tests. Um, okay, how can you tell a TIA from a focal seizure? That's an excellent question. And as I said, there are a lot of mimics to strokes. Um, so I will tell you one thing. I don't know if you remember one of my first slides said that um, a stroke is usually a loss of function. Okay, so if somebody has a stroke involving the part of the brain that has to do with their arm, they will usually, um, they will usually uh, lose function. They will get weak in that arm. The arm will become flaccid, so to speak. It will become fla flappy, floppy, and it will, you will not be able to use that arm or do anything with it. It will, it will not feel. It's a loss of sensation and motor function. Whereas when somebody is having a focal seizure, it's a gain of function. So this is actually how we differentiate. A seizure is a gain of function. A part of the brain that is responsible for the seizure is going through a little short circuit, okay? Um, and uh, th that part of the brain is uh, being overstimulated. So you a lot of times see shaking happening in the arm. You don't lose function. You actually develop spasticity or shaking in the arm. Um, and that's a gain of function. That's one differentiation. And, and sometimes it's hard to tell you, right? Um, can your presentation be repeated? I think Susan mentioned it. It will actually be, it's a, it's a recorded presentation. So yes. um, it will be available, right, Susan? Yep, it certainly will be, yes. Okay. Um, can I just read a couple more of these? Sure, please. Okay. Um, in what time frame can patient have full recovery with physical therapy? Okay, very good. That's an excellent question. And, um, you know, I can answer this for you. Um, some patients can have a full recovery within a month. Some patients will continue to recover, but recovery never ends. So just because a stroke happened three months ago or six months ago, it never ends. So if you're not 100% yet um, or 99%, recovery continues. Now, granted, most fastest recovery or improvement takes place in the first four months or so, but improvement continues. My patients who come to me two years later, three years later, they seem to be better all the time. So recovery never ends. Um, and it's really a matter of time. It's not just doing physical therapy or just taking certain medications. It's, it's you know, fortunately time is what heals us. Okay. I was once diagnosed with a possible TIA and some years later told I might have been and still be suffering with complex migraines. The major symptom is aphasia preceded by visual aura. How common is this complex migraine and is it often confused? Um, very good question. And um, I didn't quite, well, I sort of touched upon it now. Yes, certain patients with migraines can have strokes, but at the same time, a migraine um, and migraine with aura and certain complex migraines, so to, so to speak, the ones that come with certain auras like difficulty speaking, weakness. We also have a condition called hemiplegic migraines where patients look as if they're having a stroke. They're weak on one side. Um, uh, those migraines can oftentimes be confused with TIAs and strokes. Now, I will only tell you one thing. Again, I don't know your situation, but I will, I will tell you one thing. Um, if you have exactly the same syndrome happening over years and years and years, it is much less likely to be a TIA. And that's all I'm gonna say, because it's not likely to have exactly the same stereotypic symptom happening for years. You could have a migraine, you can have a seizure, but a TIA typically does not happen for years. You can have different types of TIAs, but um, usually if an artery is trying to poop out, so, so to speak, 
it does so. It doesn't just continue doing so for years. Okay, so it's um, I would have to agree that maybe um, maybe these were complex migraines, but I cannot obviously officially say that. Okay, do you have a pamphlet for patients relative to explaining stroke symptoms and what to do, especially call 911? Yes, I do actually, you know, uh, and if you go to the American Stroke Association, they also have um, pamphlets. I don't have, uh, maybe, I don't know if Susan, uh, yeah. you can contact Susan or- I uh, actually- we have, we have a pamphlet at Valley, actually, we have stroke pamphlets. We do, that's a great, thank you so much, Dr. Noskin. Yeah, um, actually, if you want to send me, uh, anybody wants to send me their information, um, I can email it to you or send it, send the pamphlets to you. I can probably scan it in, right? And then send it to you. Um, if anybody's interested in that, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. All right. That's it. I don't see any more questions. Thank you. Oh, that was, thank you so much, Dr. Noskin. That, that's just so interesting.